Hello guys, good morning. So today we are doing the <clears throat> passive questions for professional practice, um, July 2024. Huh? So I think you guys have a look at the questions really, right? So can we just quickly go through, then I'll discuss one by one. But of course, if you guys have any questions, then you may um, write in the chat box, then I'll reply to you. Lah. Okay, so let us start with the first question. Norman, an advocate and solicitor acted for the plaintiff, Sulaiman, in a defamation proceeding against a defendant, Mu Sami, a wealthy businessman turned politician. The hearing was scheduled to take place before on justice, but due to the transfer, the matter was fixed to be heard before Abu Bakr justice. Norman immediately filed an application to rescue Abu Bakr justice, and he has previously read a blog which had alleged that Mutu Sami and Abu Bakr justice were since holidaying together in Hawaii, and Abu Bakr justice wife worked in the foundation set up by Mutu Sami. Um, <clears throat> then, Norman did not consult the plaintiff before filing that application. He has, before the filing of the application, publicized in his own blog a copy of the cross paper relating to the application of the rescuer under the caption, Dear Polico Scandal. I don't know how to pronounce it. He also stated in great details the reason why the rescuer should be sustained. He ended the blog entry with the words, That only a retard will continue to stay. When the matter came up for the hearing of the application for recuser, the following exchange took place between uh, Abu Bakr Justice and Norman. Oh, by the way, this wording means uh, they are requests to change the judge. So, for example, I have a case before uh, Judge A. So, I feel he may bias or he may some conflict of interest. So, I want to change into another judge. So, this means that. Uh, so, the judge just say, are you authorized by your client to file this application? Then the lawyer say, the application has been filed. Why bother? Please rescue. Then lawyer, uh, the, the judge say, how sir, please answer the questions. Then he answered, that question is irrelevant to the application. Then the uh, judge says, compose yourself. That question is relevant and may I have a reply? Then the lawyer say, your lordship must have hearing issue or is the problem of deep rotted and has tra traveled from the ear to the brain? Retard. Okay. So then the judge says, counsel, may I remind you to conduct yourself with the decorum? Then Norman shamed the brief on the table and quickly left the courtroom and uttered, I will take my case to the court of public opinion. So which means I think he want to share in the public uh, or social media. Then Sulaiman was shocked to witness the incident and confronted Norman, who stated, I'm a barrister and immunity applied against negligence and I'm immune from contempt of court. So we need to advise the client, Sulaiman. With reference to the relevant legal provision and decided cases, what amounts to contempt of court and what type of contempt of court? So I think apparently this lawyer is like quite rude to the judge. Lah. So I don't think it will happen in real life. Lah. So basically, to share with you, we have three types of uh, contempt of court. Okay, so the three types will be contempt in the face of the court. And second is scandalizing the court or the judge. And the third one is subsidized comment. So my opinion is that there are three types of uh, content uh, in this question. How to say, uh, I quickly explain what is the difference uh, between these three. Uh. So content in the face of the court means like, in front of the judge, you say straight away a uh, disrespect to this judge. So for example, in this case, you should always say, the question is irrelevant and your lordship must have hearing issue. All this is considered a disrespect to a judge. Uh. So in front of the judge, you say something rude to the judge. Lah. And then second uh, is scandalizing the judge, which means you are talking um, bad mouth about the judge. Lah. So on the facts, I think you can follow also. Lah. Because just because the judge and the wife, uh, the wife were in the foundation set up by the Mutu Sami, and also they went together with Hawaii, then without giving a chance, ah, then he should have made his comment on the blog and say only retard will continue to stay. I think this kind of comment also quite disrespectful. Lah. And the last one is subjudiced comment. Okay, subjudiced comment is more like this. Before the court make any decisions, then you're trying to give your opinion in the social media. So try to influence the decision. So for example, ah, I give you an example. Ah. So um, let's say before uh, our ex-prime minister convictions, right? Then someone go and commented to say, Whoever the judge make decisions to acquit or, or, or say Najib is not guilty must be uh, last one already. 
So this kind of comment, when you see it, uh, before the judge make the decisions, uh, this is subjudice comment already. The purpose of subjudice basically is to ensure the judge can make decisions based on his finding. And it's not because of the pressure from the public. So this is subjudice. So on the facts result, I think there is a subjudice uh, because he said, if uh, there is a conflict and he said, oh, uh, the rescue must be sustained. Otherwise, then only retard will be continue to stay. So basically, he's giving the pressure to the judge to say, you must allow my application. Otherwise, there is a bias. Uh. So you shouldn't say that before the judge make any decisions. Uh. And also when the judge asks you, right, you also refuse to answer. So basically, this is also another disrespect to the judge. Uh. Okay. So to answer this question is 10 marks. Uh. So usually my, my advice is 10 marks, your answer will be like one page. Uh. So then you need to write the three type of the content. Then you will briefly explain the how it happened in the on the facts uh, re relate to the facts. So okay, okay. Uh? So if you guys have any question, just type in the uh, chat box. Then I will reply. Uh? Do we have to say? Do we have to say civil contempt, criminal contempt as well? Uh? Um, you I don't, that? um. Okay. Based on the syllabus, you only need to tell what type of uh, contempt of court. Uh? I don't see you need to explain civil or or criminal uh? Okay, and because you see, I have ten marks, ma. So we can we we have three type of the content of court, ma. So one you write a, around three marks, but I think one or two paragraph, and then second one also one and two paragraph, third one also one and two paragraph. I think should be sufficient for you to get the ten marks ready. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Next one. Discuss the scope and extent of the power of the court to punish for the content of court. So the powers, we can refer to. I mean, this one maybe you guys need to memorize uh. they have a session to say basically is this too long for Supreme Court the power for you to punish for the content of court is article 126 federal constitution and section 30 of the CJA court or judicature act on the other hand for sovereign court lower court uh, the powers to condemn will be section 99 capital A uh, subordinate court act 1948 and paragraph 26 of the third schedule uh. so you just need to memorize these two sections then you can answer for that question already. Some of the question is only worth like five marks. Huh? So I think it should be sufficient by writing this section. So, but the difficult part is you need to memorize huh? because this, this statute you cannot bring in. Huh? So you need to memorize. Huh? Are we okay? Okay, I think someone joining. Okay, so let me proceed. Huh? If you guys need to write down or copy, please let me know. Huh? Okay, next one. Whether a counsel is immune from a claim in negligence for the conduct. Okay, because on the facts, right, our uh, lawyer, Norman, say, I'm barrister and immune applies against negligence. I'm immune from contempt of court. So this statement actually is not true. Right? Why? Number one, Malaysia does not have the difference between barrister and solicitor. If you notice, right, all the law firms in Malaysia, uh, we don't say, oh, we are barrister, oh, we are solicitor. No, we will write both. We are advocate and solicitor. The reason being is that in UK and in Hong Kong, they will have separate, it's like barrister, handle court case, solicitor, ma majorly handle the documents. Uh, but in Malaysia, we, we actually no difference. You can do both. You can go to court also can. You want to prepare for the S&P file also can. So that's why we call it ourselves advocate and solicitor. So in that case, uh, in Malaysia, uh, we are si not seen as UK. Ma. So in our case law also say, uh, our Gobat Suryama, uh, in the case of Ling Sok Wat versus Wong Sing Chong, he say, advocate and solicitor in Malaysia never enjoy immunity from suit for negligence. Okay, the reason why in UK there is an immunity for barrister, the reason is like this. Last time, but now no more idea. If the barrister handle a case can be sued for negligence, then who wants to act for you anymore? Why? Whenever you lose the case, then you say you want to sue your lawyer. Then for policy reason, they don't allow it uh, last time uh, in old law. But with the latest cases in UK, uh, the Arthur Hall and Hall versus Simons, uh, House of Law ended the immunity doctrine and joined by barrister for over 200 years. And tells that barrister can now be held liable for negligence because number one, there should be a remedy for a wrong. Number two, improve the standard of the bar. And number three, public confidence is not enhanced by existence of immunity. So it means to gain the confidence for public uh, is not good every time the barrister can rely on the immunity. Uh. So that's why they, they think that you there should be a, 
accountability. And if you do wrong, then you should be punished. Lah. This is the latest UK position. Lah. So in Malaysia, we never enjoy. Ah. So to answer this question, five marks, ah, you should just, uh, if longer, um, if five to six, uh, five to ten, maybe you can write some history about U UK also. Lah. But for five marks, I think you can straight away jump to the answer to say, we never enjoy uh, immunity. Maybe give some explanation that why we never enjoy. Like I say, because we are not barrister only. We are advocate plus solicitor. The reason is because barrister, we don't want to give pressure to them. We want to let them to handle freely. But because we are like mixture, ma, we have we can do advocate and solicitor. Ma. So there is no law to say like a uh, solicitor cannot be held liable or barrister can held liable, something like that. But instead, because we can do both. So when we do wrong, then we can help liable. Of course, there are some cases you can refer. La. For example, uh, um, uh, this one. When they want to file the appeal, or oh, sorry, they want they forgot the lawyer forgot to file the memorandum of appearance, then this lawyer can be held liable for that because you forgotten to file the documents as per the rules of court. Man. So this thing you cannot say, hey, I'm in enjoy immunity. I do wrong also, never mind. This is so unfair, right? Of course, I, I believe there are a few cases, uh, many cases you can remember, uh, but this is one of the cases you can use. Uh, my example for this is fail to file memorandum. And this one is failed to uh, attend the hearing for the appeal. So all these things is considered quite serious. Uh. As you know, rules of court must be strictly followed. Uh. So if you don't follow, then it may affect the, the, the chances of winning. Uh. Okay. So let us go to question two. Okay. B. An advocate and solicitor is acting for Maha PLT, the plaintiff, in his claim for outstanding debt of 1.5 million against Tahan Sanya Bahad. Maha PLT was referred to B by his friend, Kong. Who expect who expect a referral fee? Okay, I think it involves a few issues lah. So we, uh, we have we can discuss one by one lah. So number one, this is a cases for a claim lah. Uh, it's a litigation case lah, and they expect a referral fee from Kong. So Kong is not a lawyer mah. So can a non lawyer people share a profit or referral fee? Um, the answer is no lah. So if we may refer to rule 52 LPTER, the rule says that no sharing cost of profit with unqualified person. Okay, uh, I think this is straightforward. Uh. Okay, no, no sharing with the uh, unqualified person, uh, which is non-lawyer. Uh. Then a week after the service of the read and stem or claim on Tahan, go associate group to B, acknowledging receipt of the statement of claim on behalf of their client. Tahan Sanem Bahad, but requested for three weeks extension to file appearance and defense. Okay, maybe here we can test a little bit knowledge on civil procedure. Lah. What is the timeline for you to file um, what we call memorandum appearance and also defense? Anyone, anyone want to try? Okay, so... If you receive a statement of claim, you have 14 days to file memorandum appearance, another 14 days to file a uh, defense. So total will be four weeks. Huh? But here they say requested for three weeks to file appearance and defense. Huh? So apparently this lawyer also don't know the law well. Huh? It should be two weeks for appearance, two weeks for defense. Okay. Then the reason was that the CEO of Tahan Sanem Bahad who has personal knowledge of the matter was overseas. Okay, this thing also got problem. Uh. Why? Because uh, memorandum of appearance and also defense uh, do not require your client to sign. Your client only needs to sign a document. It's called affidavit. So let me show you the form. Uh. So for example, this one, uh, we go to read summons. Uh. So read summons, you see, only your lawyer needs to sign. Your client don't need to sign. Then memorandum of appearance also. Uh. So see, memorandum of appeal also is solicitor for defendant to sign. It's a lawyer to sign. Huh? Then I show you defense. I'm not sure if we have a defense here. Ah, we have a defense. Okay. So defense also, we only need, oh sorry, this is more clean. Oh, sorry. We don't have a sample from rules of court about defense. Huh? But I can tell you for sure is that memorandum of appearance, defense, we don't need your client to sign. 
only the lawyer to sign. So this statement also is wrong. Lah, okay, then continue. Mahat PLT instructed B not to agree to any extension, not to reply to go associate and to take the judgment in default without any notice. Okay. Is there a problem here if you don't reply to a lawyer when talk about uh, JID? So for those people who are very familiar with your civil procedure, then you know that actually we have a rules to say that if you want to enter a JID uh, and if the case is represented by a learned friend, uh, your open lawyer, uh, pursuant to Rule 56 P LPPER, uh, before entering judgment by default, seven days notice must be given to the another uh, advocate and solicitor. So pursuant to this rule, uh, our friend B uh, cannot listen to his client just enter JID without informing your opponent. Okay? So pursuant to Rule 56. Uh, but funny thing is there, uh, rule is just a rules, man. And then we have the case law, uh, the latest case law, uh, it considered a still valid JID, although you didn't inform your, your, your opponent lawyer. I think the reason is like this. LPPER is to govern the, the conduct and also the ethics of the lawyer. Ma. It nothing to do with the case. Ma. So if the lawyer do not follow Rule 56, right, that one is bar counsel go and punish the lawyer conduct. But it doesn't affect a client, a layman cases. Ma. So yes, the JID is still valid, but it doesn't stop bar counsel to punish the lawyer to say, why you never follow the rules? Okay? So understand, uh, the rule is you must inform your, your opponent lawyer. But based on the case law, court review says that it's still a valid JID, although you never give notice. Okay? So B was earlier promised that he would entitled to a sum equivalent to 25% of any money recovered from the defendant. Okay? So this one is you taking a portion of cut from your client claim. Is it Okay. Um, I would say slightly not okay. Why? Because we have a rule called contingency fee. Contingency fee means sort of like no win, no fee, which means only win then I take for my client option. So we don't have an express provision say cannot, but under common law, contingency fee is illegal. Section 3 CLA, Civil Law Act, incorporated the English position into Malaysia. So Section 24, Contract Act also says any contract against public policy is void. So basically, we don't have a straightforward rules to say, no, you cannot do that. But rather, we have a rules to say, oh, we follow UK style and UK say cannot. And also, Section 112 LPA says, uh, advocate and solicitor shall not purchase your client interest. How to say purchase your client interest? You take your money from your client portion. Also consider is a purchase your client interest. Man. So this one also actually is not allowed. Lah, okay? And then, anxious to please his client and watch I don't know how to pronounce, by the prospect of his own play day. Upon the expiry of the time limited of our appearance, uh, B proceeded to file judgment in default. So this one, as we discussed at first, you should inform your learner friend. Uh, but, and also your learner friend, three weeks for appearance and defend. Uh, appearance maybe is two weeks, uh, but plus defend actually is four weeks. Uh, okay, so this is all the issue we should discuss. Uh. So I repeat, uh, number one will be, uh, referral fee is not allowed. This is against the rules. And number two is um, you should inform your learner uh, opponent before you enter JID. And number three is you shouldn't take contingency fee. Okay? So this is the two, three issues. Uh. Of course, those small, small ones like over overseas, that one, uh, if you want to mention, we also can talk a little bit uh, because it's worth 20 marks. Uh. Okay? I proceed. Uh. So if, if you guys have any questions, you just write in the chat box. Uh. So Celine has engaged Pandai as her advocate in an action against her former partner, Geoffrey. With respect to property jointly acquired by them, Celine suspected that all the information she disclosed to Pandai has been shared with the party. She then discharged Pandai and retained another advocate. Meanwhile, Geoffrey has subordinated, oh sorry, subpoena, subpoena means like call as a witness, uh, Pandai to give evidence in the upcoming trial on the basis that Pandai is in the Possessions of material evidence which has been disclosed to him by Serene. Okay, so your lawyer know your some PNC information. Now your opponent want to call your previous lawyer as a witness. So as you guys know lah, it's called privilege. There is certain person people you cannot force them to give evidence in court. 
And these people is protected by privilege. So can, maybe we can reflect a little bit on this, uh, evidence ad. Uh. Section 118, evidence ad. Whoever can give a rational answer and understand the questions is competent and comparable to give evidence as a witness to court. But certain people, you cannot force them to give evidence. So the category include um, lawyer and client, husband and wife, judges, or those information involve uh, uh, our, our country security or something. Lah. But I forgot the law already. Lah. But mainly the past question will ask about husband and wife, solicitor and client. Lah. So apparently this one, you cannot force them also. And second paragraph, Selim was informed by Bantai that in one of the case management, the judge indicated that the court may incline to allow the defendant to start the case first. So, Selim is alarmed, alarmed by the subpoena, an order of production and examination of witnesses, seek or advice on the following. So, number one, the scope and legal perfection privilege. So, which means, to what extent this so-called privilege apply? In other words, if you say you cannot force, you cannot ask the lawyer to give evidence in court, to what extent? Is it forever or to certain period or only those conversations between you and me? Okay. So this is 10 marks, man. So my suggestion will be, of course, number one, you need to talk about section 118 first law, the evidence act, to say everybody, if able to give a rational answer and understand the question, is a prima facie competence and comparable. Then only we talk about privilege to say. However, there are certain people you cannot force them to give evidence in court. This one will be under section 126 evidence act. Then only you say, what are the exceptions you may force this particular person to give evidence? So there are two situations you may force a lawyer to give evidence. Number one will be, not, not to force, uh, sorry, uh, your lawyer may give evidence in court. Number one will be the client himself allow the lawyer to give evidence. So, for example, in this case, Selin said, okay, lah, never mind, Panda, you want to tell, then you go and tell in court, lah. I give you this authorization. This is number one. Number two, if the communication is for illegal purpose, ah, then the lawyer can tell in the court also. But please bear in mind, ah, there is difference between two situations. Ah. I give you a scenario. Ah. Number one is, I go and see a lawyer advice, let's say Dr. Chi. Ah. So, I ask Dr. Chi, I say, hey, I committed a crime. Uh, can you help me? Okay, in that situation, uh, Dr. Chi cannot go and tell people ran off, committed a crime because the purpose is to let me discuss with my uh, lawyer so my lawyer can advise me. But second situation is before I commit a crime, I ask Mr. Uh, Dr. Chi, I say, Dr. Chi, based on your advice, can you tell me how to commit a crime without being sued? Ah, then this one cannot because I want to do illegal purpose. Then this thing, Dr. Chi can actually be subpoenaed to tell in the court because we I am asking for an illegal purpose. So please bear in mind the difference between number one and number two. Ah. Number one is I've I done already. I wish to discuss with my lawyer. I need to be open to my lawyer. Okay. But the second situation is that um, I wanted to do some illegal thing. I asked my lawyer, teach me how to do something illegal. That one not protect by privilege. Uh, okay. So for 10 marks, I think you tell general rule, exceptions, uh, uh, sorry, 118, 126, and also the exceptions. Uh, then you should be able to get your 10 marks. Uh. Please always remember uh, all kinds of questions, right? Especially for exact questions, right? I think you write the uh, introductions. What is the law? What is your opinion? Then you will be good enough with it. But of course, for exact questions, the law will be better. You have like two school of thought. Uh. You can make it longer. Uh. So for example, certain cases say protected, what protected by privilege. Certain cases say, oh, the privilege actually is not to that extent. In this one, I think you guys can refer to evidence uh, chapter, right? If I remember correctly, there is some cases to say, uh, this kind of privilege uh, will be last until you die. Uh. So for example, my client tell me something today. Uh, this conversation must be protected until I die. Uh. I cannot say, hey, I discharge, I discharge this matter already. I complete this matter already. So tomorrow I can tell other people already. Cannot. We must keep this secret until we die. I think there's a case law, but I forgot the name already. Okay? Then, what is litigation privilege? So litigation privilege, five marks one. I think this one like specifically refer 
this privilege is only for litigation privilege. Uh. So I can read out uh, what I check in Google. Uh. So litigation, litigation privilege means any communication which is for the purpose of or leading the evidence for the use in legal proceeding. So for example, uh, today I sue company A. So company A has their own legal team or their panel lawyer. So this panel lawyer will give their advice to the company A to say, okay, you should do this, do this to prepare for your case. So this kind of conversation is for litigation purpose. Uh, it's called litigation privilege. Uh, so maybe they will like go into details like what kind of communication, what kind of privilege you are protected. So litigation privilege means like any communication is for, uh, is for the preparation for legal matter, litigation matter. Uh, okay. Then C, clarification on the order of production and examination of witnesses. Uh, so this one, very simple. You just need to refer to evidence set. Let me show you. Uh, one three five okay so this is same same title uh, order of production and examination of witnesses so the order in which witnesses are produced and examined shall be regulated by law and practice for the time being relating to civil and criminal procedure respectively and in the absence of such any uh, any such law by discretion of the court so which means we must follow evidence act unless there is no express law then up to the court to decide, okay? So, what is the uh, sequence? Uh, basically, they are saying, what is the sequence? Who should start first? So, refer to 137 evidence set. Uh, we will start with examination in chief, and then cross-examination, and then re-examination. Okay, let me explain what is examination in chief. Bracket, we call EIC. La. And then what is cross-examination? Bracket, we call CE. And then what is re-examination? Bracket, we call RE. Uh. So, examination is your lawyer, your own lawyer, uh, ask you a question. You are in court as a witness. Uh, I ask you a question. This is examination in chief. For example, today is a breach of contract cases. So, I ask you, uh, Miss So and So, can you tell court why you are in the court today? Uh, then the Miss So and So will explain, uh, or oh, I've been caught is because people owe me money, never pay. I deliver the goods ready, but he always say he has no money. Ask me to wait. So your lawyer asks you, these sessions we call examination in chief. Then when I sit down, as your lawyer, I sit down, your opponent lawyer asks you questions. Uh, yeah? The examination of a witness by the adverse party, uh, your opponent lawyer, uh, it shall call cross-examination, CE. For example, just now the miss so-and-so say, Ma, oh, I deliver goods already, I done my part, but she, they never pay me. So the opponent lawyer will start attacking to say, are you sure you done your job? When do you deliver? Do you know that your goods is defective? Do you know you uh, were late deliver the goods so my client suffer losses? Uh, so the opponent lawyer challenge you these sessions we call cross-examination. Okay. Then when we've done the second part, the third part will be your lawyer asks you a question again. We call re-examination. So like ask you again. So in these sessions, I will stand up and ask my client again, me so and so. I say, just now, my, my opponent lawyer questioned you to say you never fulfill your part. Can you explain to the court why you still believe you have uh, you done your part? Then the witness will start giving excuses again no? to say, okay, refer to this document. We actually done already. And then when we check with them, they say, okay, we did, although it's a bit of defective, something like that. So I repeat the same whole thing again. Huh? Every witness will have three sessions. Number one, examination in chief. Your lawyer asks you a question. Number two, your opponent lawyer challenge you because CE, cross-examination. And the third one will be or your, your law, own lawyer ask you again because re-examination, RE. So for this, you just need to explain, copy 135, 137, and give some explanation as what I said just now. You can get your five marks for C. Okay? Okay, good, good. So far, nobody asked questions, so I still assume you all understand. Uh. And then, next one. Ahmad has a lot of uh, Sorry. Uh, Tenga, uh, one thing. If let's say this one is under Evidence Act, if the mm. owners is on the is on the prosecution, then they can start the case. La. But can we cite uh, what you call this uh, from the civil procedure also? Because civil procedure says that sometimes the defendant will be given the opportunity to start first if the burden of proof is on him. 
Can yeah. we cite that as well? Yes, yes. Okay, actually, you see, uh, um, 135 says uh, the sequence is for civil and criminal, which means whatever I say just now, uh, generally is applied, is the same for civil and criminal. It doesn't matter. But what you say is like in certain situation, the phantom may start first. Yes, it may happen. It may happen. I think it may happen expressly there is a presumption. For example, uh, if you guys know section 114A, uh, the, the burden reverts to the defendant to prove I am not the user account. I am not posting something on Facebook. When that happens, uh, I as a defendant, I have to prove my case first because the burden reverts to anyone. So defendant will start first. Understand? Okay. Yes, 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 I understand. Thanks. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, question. Ahmad has lodged a formal complaint to the disciplinary board against Hamil. After complying with the preliminary requirements, the disciplinary board appointed a disciplinary committee to proceed to inquiry into the complaint lodged against Hamil. Hamil challenged the composition and jurisdiction of the disciplinary committee. The disciplinary committee made a decision rejecting Hamil's challenge on its composition and jurisdiction. So, basically, I mean, saying that um, this appointment of committee, I don't like it. I don't agree to it. Maybe some reason that he think may have bias or what. Lah. So he don't agree to this panel uh, committee. Okay. Then, although notified the date of the inquiry, Hamil declined to take any further part in the inquiry before the disciplinary committee. So he refused to go. Lah. So Hamil now seek your advice on the following. Number one. What recourse is open to him to challenge the decision of the disciplinary committee and whether we may apply to for judicial review against the decision of the disciplinary committee six months? I think all this kind of question actually, I don't know last year when they asked before. Lah. So basically, they asked two questions. Number one, what can I do? How to challenge? Number two, can I ask for judicial review? If you guys know, right? Um Pursuant to 130 uh, L, um, LPA, uh, if you are not happy with the decisions, uh, you see the title also called uh, Objection from Any Decision, etc., other than final order or decision made by the disciplinary board. Uh, and if you refer to sub rule 2, uh, okay, I read up for you, uh, where the objection raised in respect of a composition or participation of any member of the disciplinary committee or the disciplinary board, as the case may be. In the meeting, proceeding, or inquiry before the disciplinary committee or disciplinary board, the procedure to deal with, with the objection shall be set up in the rules made by this part. So there is an express provision to challenge if you are not happy with the compositions. Okay, But the funny part is uh, when you are not happy, right? Uh, here say other than other other than the final decisions. Uh, so then they say uh, must follow the rules. Uh. So the rules actually also ask you to appeal. Uh. Okay. So a grief party may appeal against the decisions. Uh. So they deleted sub rule 2. Uh. So what is sub rule 2? Let me show you. Uh. This is the past year question asked in 2022. Wait, uh, I clear it, but it didn't come out. Okay. So in this case, uh, also they ask, can we uh, file judicial review against a uh, disciplinary committee or board decisions? So in this case, uh, they say actually we can. Why? Uh? It's because, like I said, last time, you see, Last time, uh, the 103E sub 2, uh, actually it's EA, it's not E. Uh, is it? Uh, e, sorry. 10 sub 2 E, uh, you see now sub 2 deleted it. Uh, but last time, uh, there's an expert provision say there shall be no judicial review against any decision. So last time, is the law does not allow you to have judicial review. But now, because deleted it, uh, so it becomes uh, you can actually file judicial review. So to answer these past questions, uh, you can actually file a judicial review because the answer is there is no more 103E sub 2. But in this case, the court still disallow the, the judicial review is because uh, uh, wait, uh, <clears throat> okay, 
we should not intervene at this stage until disciplinary board has considered the form of punishment to be imposed on the applicant under Section 94. Accordingly, this appeal should be dismissed, but without prejudice to such further application as the applicant may desire to make in the light of proceeding taken and the order made by the disciplinary board. What does it mean? Uh? Because in this case, uh, the disciplinary board actually has yet to make final order. Uh, but I forgot what, what is the fact should be. Uh. Basically, the disciplinary board just say, make some rulings, uh, but the ruling is not a final order yet. Then this applicant not happy with it. He should have found judicial review. Then the court say, yes, by the little sub two, it means we still have a right to file judicial review. However, I think your application for judicial review is premature, too fast already. Because you can only file judicial review where there is a final order. But since the board had yet to make any final order, then why you want to file judicial review? So I think similar to this case also. Like, actually, there's no final order. Ma. They just don't allow you for the compositions. Ma. So even you're not happy, right? The order is still not final yet. It's not saying you lose the case. It's just basically the panel, you don't like the people only. And you don't even give me a reason why you don't like that. So my opinion is that we need to apply 103E sub 2 to say removal of the wording. We can technically file a judicial review and follow in this case, Ong, Ong Keng Kiong versus Lembaga Tak Tak Tepian Pekuan Pekuan. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is the disciplinary board in Malay. Lah. So this case says, yes, you are allowed to file, but your action is premature, too fast, because the board has yet to make final order. So I think you can apply this case and the facts to our questions to say you must wait until the final order, then only you can do it. Understand? Can I? Then, what are the grounds for the decision may be impounded, impeached, impouched? In, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce, but I know the meaning. Uh, it's like at that. Uh. Actually, the facts is quite short, but I what I can think of is that <clears throat> number one, 103E sub 8. Oh, sorry. 103EA. 103EA uh, sub 8. Nothing in this section shall preclude any aggrieved party from raising objection under this section as a ground of appeal. In an appeal, maybe he may file in the section 103E. It means uh, if you are not happy under this uh, order other than final order, uh, this one can be used as a ground to appeal in 103E, which is the section we mentioned just now, uh, appeal. So this one, it will be the first section I will use. Uh. Second is, <clears throat> when the board rejected my, 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 my challenge, right? They also never give reason. Actually, they should tell me what is the reason. Uh. Although I, I, I need to tell a reason why I challenge also. Uh. So I would think, they also never tell me a reason. It's a second reason for me to put in the grounds of appeal. Because you know, when you appeal, uh, you need to ask the judge to prepare a grounds of judgment uh, to tell you why you dismiss my case, why you allow my case, uh, so that you can uh, write your grounds of appeal. Uh. So similarly, I believe here also, uh, you should tell me a reason so I can I can what. Uh. But like I said, the facts is very limited, so we don't know. Uh. But for 40 marks, we have no choice. We have to write something up. Uh. And the third one I write is, I think they did never follow section one, 100. Uh. Why I say that uh, is because, you see, by right, uh, if upon receiving complaint, uh, the disciplinary report shall, number one, no merit dismisses. If there's a merit, merit, serve a copy to the lawyer. Ask the lawyer to give explanation. If don't give, then only the uh, board can deal with it summarily. But if the lawyer gives explanation, no merit dismisses or merit then proceed. So this should be the proper procedure. You should take one by one. It's not like people file complete, then you should open file. But on the facts, uh, like I say again, it's a limited facts. Uh. Lodge a complaint, complying with the preliminary requirement, the board should wait upon the committee. Already. Without mentioning whether you serve me the documents or not, whether you ask me to provide explanation or not, you should have open file, appoint a panel, a committee, sorry. So what I can think of is these three reasons. Number one, 103 EA sub 8 allow me to raise this objection as a grounds of appeal. I'm not happy with the, 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 the panel. Number two, when the panel reject my, my request, right, the challenge, right, they just reject without telling me a reason. Number three, they never do this kind of uh, procedure. Give me a copy, tell me what happened, why people complain me, 
whether there's a merit or not, they never do this. So this will be my complaint. Uh. Understand? Okay. Uh. Good. Uh. So we continue. Uh. <clears throat> okay. Question five. Z has a house in Ipoh, Perak, which was erected on free whole land. On 5th October 2020, Z entered into a sales and purchase agreement to sell her Ipoh house to G, her old her colleague from Singapore, for a total sum price of 500000 Upon signing the SMP, G paid Z a sum of 50000 as a deposit. It is an express term of the SMP that the balance purchase price of 450000 was to be paid to G, by G to Z, uh, within four months. From the date of the SMP. It's also a term that the SMP shall be binding on the uh, successor in title, representative, and lawful assigned to both Z and G. Okay. Uh? If you guys don't understand the facts, please let me know. Uh? Then, two months after signing the SMP, G paid Z another 350000 towards the purchase price. G told Z that it's slightly out of funds, but will definitely make the full payment of the balance purchase price of 100000 within the completion date in the SMP i.e. on or before 4th uh, April, February 2021. Z also gave a key to the Ipoh house to G, and G has been staying there since. So, Z, yeah, let me have one more. Z had also signed the Memorandum of Transfer, Form 14A, under NLC, in flavor of G, and deposited it together with the original document title with G solicitor. So, Form 14A is a transfer, transfer of name form, like, and then uh, original documents like that basically means the title lah, okay? Or, or old, old people always call Gerang, Gerang, you know, Gerang. And then, unfortunately, a week after uh, handing over the Ipoh house to G, Z met with the accident and passed away on 3rd January 2021. Upon hearing Z's death, G felt that he had no further obligation to make payment to Z. Z's son Kwad was overseas at the time of her mother that he is now returned to Malaysia and obtained a grant of profit for the estate of Z. Okay. Again, you guys stop me uh, if you don't understand. Uh. In February 2024, he is now lawful executed. Hey, but we stopped here for a while. Uh, you see, he only got the grant in February 2024, passed away in 2021. So what is the issue here? If you guys remember your civil procedure, right? That is the difference between dependency claim and also estate claim. Uh. So, let me show you. Uh, I also forgot the time. So, if you are suing for... Oh, sorry, not relevant. Because the timeline is you are suing the deceased person as a defendant. But we are now a plaintiff, uh, so it's fine. Sorry. So he's a lawful executor and sole beneficiary of Z estate. Quad noticed that Z has not paid the balance receipt price of 100000 for the Ipoh house. He further noted note that the duration of Z to pay the balance purchase price under the SFP had long expired. Quad also found out that Z is a Singapore citizen and Quad had done a land search at the land registry and discovered that the Ipoh house was still registered under Z name as owner. Quad sent a written notice to Z, terminating the sale and purchase agreement and demanding the vacant possession of the Ipoh house be re-delivered to Quad as Z lawful um, executor and beneficiary. Yeah. So in reply to Quad notice, Z alleged that Z, uh, G alleged that Z has already sold the Ipoh house to G and corrected the substantial sum of money as payment for the purchase price. Therefore, based on the equitable principle, Z is merely a bare trustee for the, of the Ipoh house, and Z, G is now beneficial and lawful owner. What fails feels that G is wrong because in Malaysia, all matters relating to law are governed by NLC, and no English equitable principle are applicable. So, number one, is quite right in his allegation that it English equitable principles are, are not applicable in Malaysia. I would say like right or wrong. Ah. You can say right, you can say wrong. Why? Because ah, pursuant to section 6 of our CLA, you know, when Malaysia get independence, ah, we, we ha um, have this law, ah, Civil Law Act, ah, to say that 
Okay, this Ching Choi. No bad trust being peculiarity of English landlord should be excluded by Section 6 of the Civil Law Act. Which means Section 6, uh, CLA says, uh, if we have our own law, we should follow our own law unless um, uh, that law does not conflict with our Malaysia law. So from this, uh, generally, we don't apply equity because equity is UK law. And our land law, we follow Australia law. It's called torrent system. So I briefly explain, explain a little bit. Uh. Torrent system means uh, in layman terms, uh, registration is everything. Everything must register. But compared to equity, uh, equity is more like you don't register also, never mind. As long as you can show some interest on the land. So for example, uh, a husband and wife have a matrimonial house. But the house is purchased by the husband and registered in the husband's name. So by right, if you follow the torrent system, uh, the house is fully belongs to the husband. But if the wife can prove uh, the wife give out the uh, give out the job, take care of the house, is a housewife, uh, the law may protect her also to say the husband actually holding the property on trust for the wife for half share because the wife also contributed to the house. Okay. So this is some sort of like equity. Lah. So why the reason I say the question is right or wrong is because technically, no, we, we cannot apply equity. But yeah, let me off. But our Borneo housing case also says uh, it is too late now to question the epic applicability of the concept of the bad trust in favor of the purchaser situation in Malaysia. Why? Uh? It's because uh, when you have one case apply equity, uh, how can you the second case say you don't apply that? So that's why they say oh, it's now too late already. Although technically we follow Australia style, but because we apply one time already, so slowly, slowly we actually actually accept equitable uh, principle in Malaysia land law as well. Lah. Okay. And some more, ah, if you refer to this uh, case, ah, um, can yow, ah, by playing the full purchase price, ah, the four respondent actually become the beneficial owner. So ideally, of course, you must register your name. Lah. But you see, if today we are not buy a land for Dr. Chi, we are not pay money to Dr. Chi. But when transfer the name uh, in the land office, uh, it may take time. Uh, you cannot expect I pay money, then straight away you go to land office, register my name straight away, right? It may have a gap. Uh, and sometimes, let's say land office reject. So that period, uh, you cannot say Renault is not an owner, right? Renault pay everything with you. So in this case, they saying that. If Renault have paid everything to Dr. Chi already, in the period of register or transferring the name, uh, although it's not under Renault name, but Renault actually is a beneficial owner already. Why? Because you cannot say Renault paid everything to Dr. Chi, then in this period of register, register Renault name, Dr. Chi faster go and sell to another person. Cannot be, man. So the law actually also protect Renault for the time when Renault paid uh, all full purchase price already. But back to here, you see, next question. Can G argues that he is the beneficial owner and Z is only the bad trust? The answer is no. Law. So we need to refer to the case law to say, you will only hold as a trust for someone if you pay the full purchase price. And the transfer name uh, is more like a procedural thing. But in fact, I have done everything I should done. I do have an intention to transfer to you. But on the facts, because G still owe 100,000 to to our Z. Ma. So therefore, the trust does not apply here. Uh, so for trial marks, I think my advice will be, the sequence will be, oh, sorry, for A, uh, you can write Section 6, Silver Law Act, and then for your case. One say cannot, another one case law say it's now too late. And for this part, my suggestion is you can write torrent system in disability, which means you must register your name, then only the law protect you. However, Borneo and also this earn the case uh, to say as long as if you pay already, then the transfer of name is just a procedural thing. The law will still give you equitable right. You are the beneficial owner. However, on the facts, G does not pay the full purchase price. Therefore, the law does not protect him. So there is no bare trust. Understand? Uh? I think question five considered quite easy. Uh. Okay, shall we continue? Okay, Mutu runs a uh, Quad tree farm on his agriculture land. 
In order to expand his business, Mutu took a loan from Baik Bank. Mutu created a first-party legal charge over his farmland as security for the loan from Baik Bank. Mutu has been buying fee from uh, Chick Feet on a credit basis. Mutu assured Chick Feet not to be uh, not to be afraid of his defaulting on payment for fee. He was the old as he was the owner of the big poultry farm. A few years later, due to the outbreak of certain chicken disease, Mutu suffered heavy losses. He defaulted on the repayment of his loan to buy it back. He also defaulted on his payment to poultry fee to chick farm, chick fee. Buy bank commenced legal action against Mutu to recover the loan. Buy bank had obtained an order for sale of the poultry farm land. A public auction was conducted and Padu was the successful bidder for the poultry farm land. Pursuant to the terms of proclamation of sale signed between Patu and Bai Ben, Patu had paid 10% of auction sum as a deposit and had another 120 days on the proclamation of sales date. To make full payment of the balance auction purchase price, Patu has sufficient fund and is ready to make payment of the balance auction purchase price to Bai Ben within 30 days. Okay. Meanwhile, after Patri farmland was sold to Badu at the public auction, Mutu entered into a private settlement with Chick Fee to settle his outstanding debt with them. He had signed a memorandum of transfer 14A of the National Land Code, transferring the poultry farmland to Chick Fee to settle his outstanding debt to them. Chick Fee had entered a private cabinet on the poultry farmland to protect its interests. Chick Fee had also approached um, Bai Ben and requested a redemption statement to fully redeem the land from Bai Ben. Um, just sharing, uh, if any of you don't know what is retention statement. Retention statement basically is like this. If I have a land, I still owe my money to my bank, but I don't know the exact amount. Uh, so then I ask the bank how much I still own you. Either I will pay you back or my potential buy buyer will pay you that amount. Uh. That one is called redemption statement. Redemption is like buying back. Uh. So how much I can buy back the, the title. Uh, okay. So, Badu is now find out about uh, Chick Fee claims against the poultry farmland advised Badu as the following. What is Badu legal position as the successful bidder? So imagine if you are Badu, right? You bid the land already, you pay the 10%, you're also ready to pay the balance purchase price. But now suddenly people say, hey, I have a uh, right on this land. I want to stop you. I enter Kevin. I stop this transaction. How you feel? Isn't it like a bit risky if you are buying landlord house, right? So, um, if I may show, then we go to our section 267, effect of sales. Huh? So, if you follow 267 sub 1 sub A, huh? I read out for you. Huh? Any certificate of sales is given to purchaser under subsection 259 sub 3 or 265 sub 4 in respect of any charge land or lease shall be treated for all the purposes of the, this act as an instrument of dealing and shall be registrable according to Part 18 and upon registration thereof, A, the title or interest of the charger shall pass and rest in the purchaser, free and discharge from all liability under the charge in question and any charge subsequent thereto. So which means, uh, in other words, uh, when you bid the land, when you buy from auctions, the title give you give to you is free from all liability one. You cannot still have unfinished business with the previous owner one. Okay, number one ah. and number two, he asks you what is my position. But I did the land with you. So now so far, um, our chick fit go and enter it or what is my right ah? I would say Badu still preview chick like chick fit because Badu beat the house first. Then only this uh. Uh, what we call uh, Mutu. Go and enter another SMP or transfer with uh, Chief Fee. Actually, when the house is being laid long, uh, it's being auctioned, uh, this owner, uh, Mutu, uh, has no right to assign or sell to another person already. So the procedural-wise and the timelines, uh, Padu has a uh, priority uh, or better right. Uh. Because right now, Badu and also Chifit has yet to register their name, right? So technically, if we follow Torrent system, uh, we only look at like the register owner. Uh. But 
But right now, Padu and Chifit have yet to register. Ma. So we need to compare who got the better right in equity. No? Then if you compare, definitely it's Padu. Why? Because Padu follow all the procedure. But compare, in, um, on the other hand, if you look at Chifit, uh, Chifit does not acquire a proper title is because the person sell to you don't even have the right at the first place. The right already given to the bank and the bank already let on the house. So how can you go and sell to another person? Eh? So from there, I think you can answer for these questions. Oh, Badu got the better right now. Okay. Then, <clears throat> will the private settlement between Mutu and Chicken, uh, Chick Fit affect Badu right to the top, top three farmland? So I would say no. Lo. Similar answer. Mutu has no right to sell already. He already given the right to the bank already. Uh, okay. Uh. So here maybe you can emphasize more on the sections to say what is the effect when I bid the land for auction? What is my protection? So here we'll be more focusing on um, whether Mutu had the right to, to sell and whether Chief Vick can still enter contract when the land already auctioned. Okay. And last one. Does the Chief Vick has the right to redeem the property after it has been sold by way of public auction? So which means when the house landlord already can Chief Vick go and ask the bank, hey, why not we settle? Lah? Okay. The answer is yes and no. Lah. Why I say yes and no? Ah, it's because okay. <clears throat> two six six. Chajo Chajo means uh, mutu lah. has right to tender payment at any time after, before the conclusion of the sale. Okay. However, uh, in this United Malaya Banking versus Chongpansan, uh, once order for sale has been made by the court, the court does not have the power to make new order for the property to be sold by way of private treaty. Because when you want to, in private sector this matter, uh, we call private treaty, uh, according to case law, means cannot. Why? The court already make, option, uh, make, make, make order for sale. Uh. How can you later on go and change land? When the court say yes, mean yes already. You cannot simply change one. You must make application to change. So in this case, uh, Chong Ban San says, actually, uh, our chick fee cannot go and redeem the property uh, because auction already made. Uh. But opinion data says ah, uh, opinion data means um, you know when the court make a ruling, they give a uh, reason we call ratio tacit that time uh. But opinion data means ah, uh, the court did not make decision on this case, but they give their uh comment. They say oh what if what if this thing happened? So they, they give their opinion uh, This thing we call opinion data. Uh. A charge may be for order for sale with the consent of the charge. Charge mean bank uh sell the property by way of private treaty. So which means you can still do private treaty if there is no order for sale. But on the facts, there is order the, there is an order for sale already. Pay, pay deposit already and ready to make payment already. So I think back to these questions, um, you are not allowed, lah, especially uh, our Badu already pay that person already. So I think you cannot do that. Lah. Okay. Can we go to our last then, Mimi uh, owns a big house in PJ, Selangor. The property is currently free for encumbrance. So, free for encumbrance means uh, there is no, mm, no owing any money to the bank. Uh, in, in, in simple words. Uh, okay, uh, but actually, free for encumbrance got many, many meanings. But in general, we refer to no encumbrance means you are no owing to any bank. So, Mimi has kept the document, issue documents or title of the house in her bank safe uh, deposit box. Mimi has been reading a lot of about four different transactions involving property in the newspaper. She is very worried and intends to um, enter a private caveat to protect her title and interest in her property. Mimi comes to seek your advice on the following. So number one, can Mimi enter private caveat on her property? Okay, your owner, you are owner, so you want to enter caveat on your own land. Um, I will say that the answer should be yes or no. Lah. Why? Because uh, if you refer to <clears throat> 322, because 322 is the section to say ma, who can enter the keyword, right? <clears throat> 322 sub 1 sub A. <clears throat> Just a moment. Okay. So a keyword shall be entered. Wait, uh, let me check again. Oh, sorry, it's 323 sub 1 sub A. 
So the person and body at whose instant a private keyword may be entered are number one, any person, any body claiming title. Okay. Number two, any person, any body claiming to be beneficiary entitled. Okay. And three, guardian or next friend or minor claiming entitled to. So which means that you are only claiming title, claiming registerable interest and right to title, then you can you can uh, enter a caveat. Lah. So in this case, uh, you are the owner already. Ma. Why you want to enter a caveat? Eh? And there's a case law also say um, you cannot enter a caveat for your own land unless, unless uh, somebody is suing you or is like attacking you or make some court order against your property, then you can enter. Uh. But generally, you cannot enter. Uh. That's why I say yes and no. Uh. Yeah, let me see. Uh. Ah, this one. Registered proprietor cannot give it his own land unless he is coveting to it to protect some interest other than as a registered proprietor. Okay, so to this answer, uh, this question five marks uh, I will use section three two three sub one sub a and also this case Asian commercial finance. Okay, five marks. And next one. Mimi wishes to seek the help of her cousin, Rina, to enter private caveat on Mimi property. She seek your advice on whether this is possible. Um, again, I think I will use section 323 sub 1 sub a. Lah. You must make sure your cousin is claiming yeah, title, registrable interest, or right to title. If your cousin is a joint owner or is like wanted to buy this house to enter caveat, it's fine. But because your cousin just helped you, man, so I think it's cannot. Lah. Ah, okay, five marks. I think we just simple settle it. <clears throat> we go last one. Fine Bank has granted Achu a business loan amounting to 300000 As security for the business loan, Achu brother, Afu, intends, intended to create a third-party legal charge over Afu house to Fine Bank. Fine Bank panel lawyer, Lazi, used Fine Bank standard pre-printed loan document for the loan documentation. However, Lazi used the wrong set of documents and created a first party legal charge instead of third party legal charge over Afu Bank, uh, Afu property. Okay, just sharing with you uh, what is first party and what is the third party charge. Uh. First party means uh, you buy the house, you borrow money. This is first party. Third party means uh, a person buy a house and the person borrow money. Uh, it's not the same. So if me and my wife buy a house, but only me borrow money. Uh, also consider the party. Uh. It's not saying, oh, Renault go buy a house. Renault also borrow money. Although the, the house is buy under Renault and Renault wife. Uh, it doesn't mean it's a first party. Uh. First party means it must be exactly the same. Who buy the house? Who borrow money? This is first party. As long as the person buy the house and the person borrow money, uh, it's not exactly the same. Uh. Maybe overlapping. Uh, it's a third party. Really. Okay? So, when the duly registered charge document were returned to Fine Bank for their safekeeping, they noticed the error. Fine Bank had approached you to seek your opinion as to what steps should be taken to rectify the situation and whether the error would affect the indivisibility of the charge created in favor of Fine Bank. This question actually I think is a bonus also lah, because it's been asked in the past question a few times already. Lah. So the keyword is rectify and also error. So I think the chapter you can go to is uh, indivisibility. The section is 380. Okay. 380 NLC empower the registrar to rectify error if he satisfied any of the three situations. Okay. Title has been registered. Wrong name. Memorial or other entry has been made in error. Memorial and other entry contain an error or omission. So there's a mistake lah, or, or error. Lah. However, there are two cases we must take note. Number one. Island versus Peninsula Development. Section 380 sub 1 sub 8 is confined to any error or omission made by the registry and do, does not extend to that made by the party in the instrument or transfer. So in other words, uh, if you follow Island this case, uh, they say uh, 380 ratification if the mistake is made by land office. Okay, then only you can ratify. But with the latest case 2017, uh, 
Malaysia Building Society per Heart versus KSCS, KCSB. Uh. This one we go to our Lelong chapter. Uh. Okay, this one. KCSB intends to enter third party charge, but first party was mistakenly found in Form 16A. Federal Health Act, such error did not suffer for any deficiency. Trust, such error may be ratified by registrar pursuant to Section 380 sub 1 sub P to achieve what was the intended by the party. In other words, uh, I repeat, uh, this question asks you, so there's a mistake, can we ratify? Section 380 allowed her to ratify, but follow the case of Island and Peninsula, they say the mistake only confined to mistake made by the land office. But following the latest case, uh, federal court says, the error made by whoever also can, made by the party also can. Especially here, it's the same fact as our facts. First party and third party wrong. So you can ratify under Section 380. Okay, so these two cases then you can use and we can settle our uh, this, this question. Sir. I think this one been asking quite many times already, so you can take note of it. Uh. Okay, no question. Uh. So we proceed. Uh. Oh, sorry, I don't teach bankruptcy uh, because I also skip. Uh. So we go to our last one. Uh. The probate. So <clears throat> our probate order seventy one, rule thirty seven provides that any person who wishes to ensure no grant is made without notice to himself may enter a cabinet. Explain the procedure and the process that could be employed by the person seeking to remove the say action. So which means they are asking you how to remove a cabinet lah. So <clears throat> I think everybody understand what is cabinet, right? So basically, cabinet is the uh, action for you to lock somebody to get the grant of probate or grant of LA. <clears throat> so for example, people owe you money, then that person passed away already. So you can lock, prohibit the successor entitled to get the property, the deceased property lah, without notifying you. Lah. So the removal basically is here. <clears throat> so we just quickly go through. KVT T must issue a warning in Form 165, which must seek the interest and require the KVT to give particular of any contrary interest in the estate of the deceased. Kevet to is the person who enter Kevet. Kevet T is the person who gonna Kevet. Ah. So a copy of it must has must be served on the Kevet to and the registrar or the principal of registry. Okay, so which means you will send a form ah, to ask the person, hey, why you enter Kevet on my land? Okay, then <clears throat> if the Kevet to has not entered appearance, ah, if the Kevetto has not entered appearance within it is in Form 166, may at any time withdraw his caveat by giving notice at the registry <clears throat> and serving a copy of it on the registrar of the principal or registry. And then, if the Kevetto has not entered at uh, appearance within a speak prescribed time, may he found in the registry an affidavit showing that the warning was duly served and that he has not received the summon for the direction. Then the KVT then can proceed to apply the ground of post, uh, representation. So basically, this thing is just saying that I serve you a notice. If you don't appear, automatically I can cancel your KVT. Okay, this one more simple. Lah. But if he enter appearance, ah, then the KVT don't need to show the contrary interest. Why you enter? Tell me. It means the KVT is contesting the validity or existing of the will or any interest under intestacy. So he may need to tell lah, the KVT say, or because you owe me money, or because uh, I have some dispute with you, something like that. <clears throat> then, enter appearance in one form 166 and serve a copy on the cavity and the registry of the principal registry. Once appearance is entered, the matter shall be deemed to be contested, which means you want to fight in court already. Yeah? So, what if it enter with no contrary interest? Wishing to show clause against the making of the grant to cavity may, within eight days of the service of the warning, serve a summons for the direction. Okay, actually this thing is like quite boring. Uh. You just need to remember that you just write down. Uh. So I think it's quite pretty straightforward, right? For six months. Actually for six months, you don't even need to write so long. Uh, but because I copy from the sections, uh, so it's a bit long-winded. Uh, okay, next one. Order 71, rule 41 to 44. For the rules of court provides the procedure known as citation. Explain the meaning and type of citation as well as the procedure. Okay. I think I can also explain what is citation. Ah. So basically, citation ah, is a notice issued by the court by a citee to cite to the citee to show cross. Means, let's say, um, 
Mr. A lah, Mr. A passed away. So Mr. A have his son. So Mr. A appoint his first son as a executor. But this first son so lazy, don't want to do anything. Then the second son came, start him to say, I want to use citation. Ask you come out and talk about it. Okay. So the first thing the second son can do is ask the brother, you want to accept or refuse the crown or not? So you want to do it or not? Okay. Number two, ask the brother to take up the crown. Or number three, ask the brother to prove the view. Let's say lah, the second son suspect the view is a fake one. Then he will say, lah, brother, please come to court. I want to challenge the view. So this is the three type of the citation you may you can use up. Okay. And then uh, the procedure actually is almost the same. Why? Because uh, every citation in Form 167 must be issued from the registry. Every amendment in the citation must be verified by every David Swan by the CITO. Every view must be filed in the registry before the citation issue, except where the view is not in the CITO possession. Okay? The CITO must enter given before issuing citation. Every citation must be served personally of the CITI unless the registrar directs some other mode of service. The CITI must enter appearance. That's it. This is the procedure. Then, of course, what will happen if they default? Lah? They don't come to court. Which means I cite you already. I asked my brother already, but my brother don't come to court. Ah, then what will happen? No? If different, different type of the citation, then have different consequences. Ah. But basically, the effect will be similar like the JID. Lah, which means you can get what, what you want. Okay? So citation basically just like this. Ah. I repeat. Ah. I'm not happy. I cite the person, come to court. And the citation can be for different person. Number one, you want to accept or refuse a grant. You want to do or not. Number two, I ask you to take out the grant. With the uh, within a specific time. And number three, I think the view is not the real one. I want to challenge it. Okay. Then last one. What are the type of grant of representation may be issued by the court? Uh, this one also, I think, very simple. Uh. The grant will be this follow. Grant of probate. When there's a view, the grant you can get is grant of probate. LA review and next means what? You got the view. But then you don't have an executor. Why will you, you don't have an executor? Uh, it's because, you see, granted where there is a valid view, but no proving executor. Why no executor? Number one, the executor said, I don't want to do it. Or uh, incapacitated due to insanity or old age. Maybe too old already. Or die before the tax title. Which means, uh, the father appoint a son, but then before the father die, uh, the son died already. So there's no executor. So in that case, uh, you have a view, but then you don't have executor. So we call LA with view and next. You see, view and next, mark, which means you put behind. Mark. Okay? And the third one is LA, letter administration. When there's no view, you apply the court order, we call grant of LA. And the third one is LAD bonus note. Granted where probate or LA has been extracted, but not fully administrated. Understand? Uh? So I'll give you a scenario. Uh. Mr. A passed away, has a view. Mr. A appoint his son as an executor. The document proves the son as an executor called grant of probate. Okay. Number two, <clears throat> Mr. A has a view. He appoint the son as an executor, but the son doesn't want to, to act as an executor. Then we call it LA review and X. And then third situation, Mr. A does not have a view, pass away, then the son or the family go and apply is called grant of LA. And number four situation is, Mr. A pass away, appoint the son as an executor, but the executor uh, extract the grant of probate or LA already, does not fully administrated or done his job, we call LAD bonus note. Understand that? Huh? So this is the four, four grant, uh, type of grant of representation we, we have. Huh? Any question? Okay. If no question, then we will call it a day. Then I will see you guys tomorrow. Tomorrow I will be teaching evidence, uh, but most likely I will do it at night. Uh. I will let you guys know the time by end of today. So uh, just reserve your lovely weekend Sunday night for me. Uh. Okay. So shall we call it a day? We stop here.
Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. I hope you like it. So we will stop here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.